Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I just got a love note from the tube that they are going to start holding comments with um, certain keywords. Yeah, you know where this is going. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't hold comments. I mean, if somebody makes a comment, that's fine. I, you know, unless it's really something nasty, I, I put comments up and then I'll answer it if I think they're wrong, hoping that they're willing to take correction. But they're going to start automatically holding comments. Now, some of you make comments and they, it goes to spam and I have to unspam it. Sometimes I get a notification that somebody leaves a comment and then I go to look for it. It's not there. And then I go to spam and it's not there either. So I don't know if some people are making a comment and then deleting the comment. Then I can see it in my email, but it's not on the channel. I, I don't know. Maybe YouTube's deleting it. I don't know because there's no way for me to answer them. Um, but I just thought I would let you know that YouTube just sent a thing to me as a channel creator that they're going to start doing this. So, and uh, yeah. Also, I wish uh, to thank everybody. Uh, that prayer has been doing prayers for me. I appreciate it very much. Um, you know, I don't do this for money. Obviously, I am a I am a volunteer. I'm an amateur. You know, I don't get paid to do this. That makes me a an amateur. Uh, when you get paid to do something, you're a professional. You know, just like a professional airline pilot or a professional bus driver or truck driver you know somebody's paying them to do something that makes you a professional well that makes me an amateur so all right let's get started here get out your king james bibles i'm not sure if i've done this before in the past um, but i was going through my um Oh, I don't know what you would call it. My uh, collection of writings that I have. Some of them are mine. Some of them are other people's that I've saved for future reference. Uh, but uh, this is what I got off the Internet. Some of this I know, but I never put it together this way. Is the church fulfilling all the promises that God made to Israel. So let's take a look. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are the sons of the living God. And that's in Hosea chapter 1 and verse 10. So let's take a look at the fulfillment. That's, that's the promise that God made to Israel. Let's look at a fulfillment in the church. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now remember, in Jeremiah 3.8, God divorced Israel, but God did not divorce Judah. 
And churches refuse to make that distinction. God didn't divorce Judah for uh, David's sake, the promise that he had made to David, the king. But God did divorce Israel. And I believe Israel is the Gentiles, which the word Gentile just means nation or nations, plural. So, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, the nations, right? As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, Ye are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. And that's in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 22 through verse 26. Promises to Israel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her on her who had not obtained mercy. Now, who didn't obtain mercy? Israel. God divorced her. Jeremiah 3 8, right? And I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, why were they not his people? Because God divorced them. Jeremiah 3 8. Then I will say to them who were not my people, You are my people. And they shall say, You are my God. All right, let's take a look at something else here. In Deuteronomy 4, 14, 2, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Do we find a fulfillment of this in the church? Oh, yeah. 1 Peter 2 verses 9 through 10. But ye are a chosen people. I'm sorry. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Mercy. Promised Israel, Amos 9.11. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Fulfillment in the church. Acts 15, verses 14 through 18. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophet agree, just as it is written, After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things known to God from eternity, are all his works. Um, I'm noticing this is not the King James, but it's still, what can I tell you? All right, Joel 2, 28 through 32, Promises to Israel. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Well, that's me. I guess I'm going to be dreaming dreams. 
Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Applied to the church. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's Acts 2 verse 1, Acts 2 16 through 21. Spoken to Israel, Exodus 19 6. And ye shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Now, this is one thing the the kind of bothers me about the King James and the rest of the Bibles, and I'm not saying it's an error, because I don't know, because sometimes God purposely hides things from people, and it's up, up, up to us to be minors, and I'm not talking about underage people, I'm talking about people that would dig in the earth, searching for rare minerals, you know, we're to be minors. It says here, And you you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It's the same word that they use for Gentiles. So why didn't they use, why weren't they consistent? Oh, and, and you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy Gentile. You know, every time it would have shown that it wasn't properly used, in my opinion, they used the word nation. You know, it, it wouldn't have made sense for God to say to Abraham, I'm going to make you a, 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 a father of many Gentiles. No, they use nations. But it's the same word translated both ways. So, all right, spoken to Israel. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Exodus 19.6 Fulfillment to the church in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Spoken to Israel, Ezekiel 37, 27. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Applied to the church. 2 Corinthians 6.16 6, Now remember, Corinth, Corinth was a city in Greece. Alright, 2 Corinthians 6.16 6, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. To Israel, Leviticus 19.2 Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, Ye shall be holy, for I the Lord am, uh, for I the Lord your God am holy. 
applied to the church. 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Boy, I feel really strange reading from a non-King James Bible, but uh, this is a really... It's good info, you know? Somebody was writing me how to prove that um, the church is Israel. And this is a good way to do it. Ah, I love this. Jeremiah 31, 31. A new covenant. And if you listen to the Hebrew roots liars, they'll say, oh, no, 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 no. It's not a new covenant. It's the renewed covenant. Well, why would you need to renew something that didn't work in the first place? I mean, really, you know? It's not the renewed covenant. It's the new covenant. The blood of Christ. I mean, come on. You know, these these Hebrew roots people, ugh. All right, Jeremiah 31, 31, spoken to Israel. Behold, the days are coming, say, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. They're not the same. Apply to the church, Luke 22, verse 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after uh, supper, saying, this cup is the new testament, I'm sorry, is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, for those that are dispensational, uh, the comment is the new covenant is pro uh, particularly problematic for the dispensationalists as Jeremiah 31 is undeniably addressed to Israel. The new covenant is the very heart of the gospel, yet if the church is fulfilling the promise given to Israel under the new covenant, Dispensationalism is dead. Ryrie, R-Y-R-I-E, he's a famous dispensationalist. I think he was from Dallas Theological Cemetery. Uh, so Ryrie, in his early writings, makes this significant statement. And I quote, If the church does not have a new covenant, then she is fulfilling Israel's promises. For it has been clearly shown that the Old Testament teaching on the New Covenant is that it is for Israel. If the church is fulfilling Israel's promises as contained in the New Covenant or anywhere else in the uh, scriptures, then dispensational premillennialism is condemned. One might well ask why there are not two aspects to the one New Covenant. This is the position held by many premillennialists, but we agree that the amillennial, amillennialist has every right to say that this view, that is a practical admission that the new covenant is fulfilled in and to the church. Uh, if you don't know what a amillennialist is, that's somebody that doesn't believe. Uh, millennium just means thousand. And the millennium in the Bible is the thousand-year reign of Christ. And if you put an A before the, uh, a word, it means, uh, does, it means no, no. So a millennial would mean no, no millennium, no thousand-year reign of Christ. Um, and then the premillennial is that we are living in the age before the thousand years. Of Christ and if I remember correctly now remember this is 20 something years ago when I took this stuff post millennial means that uh, the thousand year reign of Christ was a thousand years after he died so they will tell you that right now we're living in the post millennial post thousand year reign of Christ well if this is the reign of Christ he's doing a really terrible job that's all I can tell you I mean, you know, I'm being very sarcastic. Uh, but uh, that is, you know, the Israel 
and the church, I believe, are the same thing. And that's where these pre-trib rapture people are going to be get all mixed up. Uh, these church people, when they find out that they're the ones that are going to be persecuted by the people that they think are Israel, and they're, they're either going to have to deny Jesus to save their skin, or they're going to have to die for Christ, and they start understanding who the object of Satan's wrath is in the uh, tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, I think some of them are going to actually wake up and say, wow, those identity people and post-tribbers, they were right. Some of them, probably a remnant. Uh, but you watch, the great majority of your pre-tribbers, they're Zionists, they're, they're so brainwashed by the rabbis, they're so brainwashed by the their pastors. Uh, if their pastors tell them the devil himself is Jesus Christ, or their Christ, their Messiah, they'll follow them. You watch. I'd love to be wrong. Really, I would. And that's just, thus saith Bob, I'm I'm not speaking for the Lord. That's just my opinion. So, uh, another quote. Dispensationalism has used various arguments to get around this insurmountable problem. Perhaps the boldest was the concept of two covenants by uh, Schaefer, C-H-A-F-E-R, who appears to be the originator of this idea. Um there remains to be recognized a heavenly covenant for the heavenly people, which is also stylized like the preceding one for Israel, a new covenant. It is made in the blood of Christ, uh, Mark 14, 24, and continues in effect throughout this age, whereas the new covenant made with Israel happens to be future in its application to suppose that these two covenants, one for Israel and one for the church, are the same, is to assume that there is a latitude of common interest between God's purpose for Israel and his purpose for the church. Consistent dispensationalists have long recognized the problem. Uh, Bullinger noted that the cup of the Lord's Supper was indeed the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, 31, directed to Israel and not the church, and for that very reason, the mystery church should not administer it. Hmm. I didn't know that. I had Bullinger's notes, but I didn't read much of them. Moderate, inconsistent dispensationalists, not understanding the sacrament, but still desiring to preserve their memorial, sought to maneuver out of this predicament. Uh, John Walvoord, W-A-L-V-O-O-R-D, who became the president of Dallas Theological Cemetery, and who appears to be the leading contemporary champion of the Second Covenant rites, and I'll quote, the point of view that holds to two covenants in the present age has certain advantages. It provides a sensible reason for establishing the Lord's Supper to believers in this age. And they're talking about the seven periods of time they call the church age. And then when that closes, they, then you, they, you know, um, they teach that when the church age closes, dispensationalists, um, I don't mean to be giving you a theological education, but this way at least you have an understanding. Uh, they teach that this is the sixth dispensation, which is the church age, which dispensations has nothing to do with periods of time. It has to do with giving something. Uh, dispensation comes from the word dispense. Have you ever heard of a soap dispenser? Yeah. It gives you something. Uh, it has reference to uh, Moses and the law, gave the giving of the law, or grace via Christ. There's only two dispensations, two testaments, uh, well, the Old Covenant and the New Testament. But they teach that we're in the church age, the, which is the age of grace. And they actually teach that after the pre-trib rapture, you know how people get saved, according to them? They have to keep the law. 
So they teach that when the you know who's in the Middle East, they got to rebuild a temple, and you're going to actually have to keep the law and do animal sacrifices and possibly die for your faith to be saved. They actually teach this stuff. Now, there's different flavors, you know, but what did Paul say? Uh, you know, there's only one gospel. That's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, if you believe in Jesus Christ that he was raised from the dead and died for our sins, that's the gospel. And Paul taught that if any come teaching another go any other gospel, let him be accursed. Do you know that dispensational people that believe this stuff, they're cursed. Really, they are. They teach that after the pre-trib rapture that people are going to have to, during the tribulation, people got to keep the law to be saved or die for the faith. I mean, seriously. You know, they got to write books for you to understand this stuff because if you just read the Bible alone, you'll never get it. All right, so... Um, the point of view that holds to two covenants, people, there's only one. Jesus said, uh, one, Paul wrote, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, period. There's not two. The point of view that holds to two covenants in the present age has certain advantages. It provides a re sensible reason for establishing the Lord's Supper to believers in this age in commer 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 commemoration of the blood of the new covenant. The language of 1 Corinthians 11.25 seems to require it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as ye drink, in, uh, that ye, as ye drink it in remembrance of me. It hardly seems reasonable to expect Christians to distinguish between the cup and the new covenant when these appear to be identical in this passage in 2 Corinthians 3, 3, and, 2 Corinthians 3 and 6. Paul, speaking of himself, states, Our sufficiency is of God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant. It would be difficult to adjust the ministry of Paul as a minister of the new covenant if, in fact, there is no new covenant for the present age. Walvoord discusses the epistle to the Hebrews, contrasts the Mosaic Old Covenant, the New Covenant, and his novel Better Covenant, the identification of the new covenant, which replaces the old covenant, which seem, would seem to be certain by the lengthy quotation from Jeremiah 31, which the epistle contains, and thus it is with some astonishment that one reads Walvoord's denial. So let's read what he says. The epistle to the Hebrews, by its title, is addressed to the Jewish people. Right. The epistle is planned to show that Christ in Christian doctrine supersedes Moses and the Mosaic Covenant. The argument in Hebrews 8 proceeds on the revelation that Christ is the mediator of a better covenant that, than Moses, established on better promises. At this point, the writer shows that the Mosaic Covenant was never intended to be eternal in contrast to other Jewish covenants and that the Old Testament itself anticipated the day of its passing. To prove this po point, the passage from Jeremiah on the New Covenant is quoted in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. There is no appeal at all to the content of the New Covenant with Israel as being identical with the better covenants of which Hebrew speaks. The very absence of such an appeal is as strong as any argument from silence can be. Dispensationalists determined to cling to their false distinction between Israel and the church are forced to abandon the New Covenant's application in any real sense to the church. Albertus P P I E T E R S Peter Peters, I don't know. However, representing non-dispensational commenters in general explains. This is entirely correct that Israel is meant in Jeremiah 31. And it is to the house of Israel that the fulfillment came. The objection arises from a failure to perceive that the Christian church, in its origin, was an Israelitish body. Ah, look up Galatians 3.29, people. 
that's my note. Um, objections arises from a failure to perceive that the Christian church in its origin was an Israelitish body fully qualified to claim the promises made to Israel. The Christian church, once having been established, many Gentiles came into it, but it did not make it a church from among the Gentiles. Any more than the naturalization of many Italians in our country makes it a nation from among the Italians. They were, they were all Israelitish members of the Old Covenant people of God to whom the promise had been made. Strictly in line with the promise and with the prevailing principle of the covenant, history to them, the believing remnant, the promise of the new covenant was fulfilled. The promise was to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And to the des designated parties, the fulfillment came to all who were in the sight of God and according to a just interpretation of history, still worthy of the name Israel and Judah. In all this, we are spiritualizing the prophecy as some allege, not at all. We are stating a historical fact clearly contained in the sacred records that in or about the spring of the year 30 A.D., A.D., not B.C.E. or, or C.E., when you see B.C.E. and C.E., know that you're dealing with Antichrist because they call the years of Jesus after his birth death and resurrection they call that ce the common era common i don't call christ common he was the most uncommon thing that ever happened the virgin birth and if you're looking at bce and ce well you can tell them bce stands for before christian era and then ce stands for christian era that's what i use but they they call it common era they're Antichrist. When you see BCE and CE, you're dealing with Antichrist. All right, so we are stating a historical fact clearly contained in the sacred records that in or about the spring of the year 30 AD, the mass of those who called themselves Israelites ceased to be such for prophetic and covenant purpose, having forfeited their citizenship in the commonwealth of Israel by refusing to accept the Messiah, and that after this event, all the privileges of the Abrahamic covenant and all the promises of God belong to the believing remnant and to them only which remnant was therefore and hereafter uh, thereafter the true israel and judah the seed of abraham the christian church thus promises are strictly fulfilled and definitely to the designated parties see i don't believe that i you know i think the church was israel and the israel was the church now this one writes a uh, and a thing how the pre trib rapture denies the gospel we have discussed the fact that the dispensationalist understanding of dispensation invalidates the reality of grace in any age and it does i mean if uh this is my notes when you look in the book of hebrew hebrews i think it's chapter 11 the faith chapter maybe it's 13 i i forget Forgive me, people. I'm a generalist. I don't specialize in any one area of the Bible. I just try to have a, a broad understanding of the entire thing. And the Bible is three quarters of a million words, 750-something thousand words. And um, I can't remember where everything is in that large of a thing without the Lord's help. But yeah, it's either Hebrews 11, 12, or 13, the faith chapter. Well, guess what? It talks about the Old Testament saints and Abraham and Noah and Samson. All the Old Testament saints were saved by faith, just like in the New Testament. You know, and it was grace, God's grace that saved them. It's, it was always grace and faith, Old Testament and New Testament. So, we have discussed the let's go back to this. We have discussed the fact that the dispensationalist understanding of dispensation invalidates the reality of grace in any age, 
how the dispensational kingdom offer impugns the honesty of God and makes the gospel nothing more than an afterthought, and how presumed distinctions between Israel and the church deny the new covenant to either. We will now exam examine how the peculiar dispensational doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture of the church makes manifest these errors. The novel doctrine of the pre-trib rapture is central to dispensational thinking. Um, hold on a second here. All right. Um, the novel doctrine of the pre-trib pre pre rapture is central to dispensational teaching. The removal of the church to heaven preceding before the tribulation period when the stopped prophetic clock begins ticking for Israel again with the 70th week of Daniel was Darby's innovation. My note here. When you look at Darby's family, uh, they bought a castle called Lip, L -E -E, I think it's L-E-E-P or L-E-A-P castle. Uh, I think it's Ireland. All right, that Leap Castle in Ireland was owned by the Darby family and is considered the most haunted castle in the country. I mean, what does that tell you? Birds of a feather flock together. So the people that came up, well, the devil that came up with the 70th week of Daniel where God's clock starts ticking for the uh, Antichrist in the Middle East, that was Darby's thing. And his family owned the most haunted castle in Ireland, Leap Castle. Look it up. I'm not making this stuff up. You know? I mean, you ever heard the thing, you know, truth is stranger than fiction? Yeah. And then Schofield got, you know, and his... Uh, Schofield in the Schofield Bible, he got this stuff from Darby and, you know, uh, <laughs> he, he took Darby's stuff and ran with it. So, let's continue this article. Darby broke not only from previous millennial preaching, teaching, but from all of church history by asserting that Christ's second coming would occur in two stages. The first, an invisible secret rapture of true believers could happen at any moment, ending the great parenthesis or church age which began when the Jews rejected Christ. Schofield also taught this doctrine along with Chafer, Ryrie, Valward, etc., etc., etc. At dispensational schools, failure to hold steadfastly to the doctrine of the pre-trib rapture may have dire consequences. Yeah, I found that out. Well, I tell you what, you go to a Baptist church, and if you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture, they'll uh, they'll accuse you of not even being saved if you don't worship at the feet of the you know who's Revelation three nine. But they're going to worship at my feet. That's what Revelation three nine says. But you know, what can I tell you? I, uh, yeah, I've been kicked out of many a Baptist church for uh, not bo not uh, bowing down to the pre-trib rapture. All right, let's continue the article. The doctrine of a pre-trib rapture of the church seems to be a litmus test of orthodoxy to outsiders, including classic premillennialists. This doctrine is not crucial if it is believed at all. But not only is it vigorously maintained in Dallas, a Dallas Theological Cemetery dispensationalism, but deviation from it causes a person to be suspect and institutions to shake and sometimes split. It is unfortunate that outsiders, historic premillennialists, postmillennialists, and amillennialists have not taken this distinctly dispensational doctrine more seriously, for it is here that dispensational theology stands or falls. It is the doctrine of the pre-trib rapture that proves conclusively that 
dispensational theology is not as dispensational as claim a return to biblical theology, but is rather a pseudo-Christian uh, cult. Most arguments against pre-trib rapturism have focused upon showing that the doctrine is a new development in theology and cannot be found in the scriptures. Various orthodox commentators and theologians from the ranks of each of the millennial views have presented this case with considerable skill. We will therefore take a different attack and show that the gospel is in direct opposition to the everlasting gospel of Christ Jesus. Most earlier dispensational theologians allowed that the Old Testament saints would be raptured along with the church in the pre-trib rapture. Alexander Rees, a classic premillennialist, utterly destroyed this position with convincing scriptural arguments locating the resurrection of the Old Testament saints, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints at the day of the Lord, at the end of the tribulation. Uh, my note here. See, uh, when you're dealing with these pre-trib rapture people, what they'll try to do is tell you that the day of the Lord is at the end of the uh, tribulation. And then they'll tell you that the day of Christ is a different event that occurs before the tribulation. That's To them, that's the rapture. But essentially what they're doing is denying that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, in... In Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at the time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame, and everlasting contempt. Uh, let's read Daniel 12, 8 through 13. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although I heard, although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days, but you go your way till the end, for the, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of those days. Okay. No dispensationalist will argue that the time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, the abomination of desolation, and the taking away of the daily sacrifice is not a reference to the time of the tribulation. Yet Daniel is told that the tribulation, I'm sorry, yet Daniel is told that the resurrection follows these events. Dispensationalists then, for the most part, amend their position to separate the resurrection of the Old Testament saints from the rapture. Uh, my note here, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, we read, And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. I mean, you know, the dead in Christ rise first. So, unless the dead in Christ rise before the rapture, well, this is why, you know, pre-tribbers are just, they're blinded. They're absolutely blinded. 
All right, let's take a look. Um, all right, so let's go back to the article. Many careful students of premillennial truth have come to the conclusion that the opinion that Israel's resurrection occurred at the time of the rapture was a hasty one without scriptural foundation. It seems far more preferable uh, to regard the resurrection of Daniel 12.2 as a literal one following the tribulation, but not to be identified with the pre-trib rapture of the church. The church will be raised at the time of the rapture before the tribulation, and the Old Testament saints, including Israel, at the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. And if you don't understand that, that means that, you know, they're saying basically it'll happen at the end of uh, at the end of the um, tribulation because that's when the millennial when Christ returns at the end of the tribulation that's when the thousand year reign of Christ happens um, Michael takes a chain bounds Satan for th and locks him up for a thousand years that's the millennium so let's continue the article on this point, the dispensationalists jump from the frying pan into the fire. In order to preserve the precious doctrine of the pre-trib rapture of the church, they raise the Old Testament saints apart from the saints of the church age. We note that this is consistent with the dispensational understanding of dispensations and with their distinction between Israel and the church. It also reveals that the long-standing charge made by Orthodox Christianity that dispensationalism dispensation dispensationalism teaches multiple methods of salvation is absolutely true. There's only one method of salvation, and that is Jesus Christ. That's why dispensational theology is a heresy that is cursed. It's a different gospel. It's another gospel. It's not that much different than Mormonism, if you ask me. Let us look at some of the texts regarding the resurrection of the saints. All right, so let's take a look at this article. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 55. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. The last trump. Is there another? In Revelation, there are seven trumps. And the, the trumps are during the tribulation period. So unless there's a, another last trump, before the tribulation, it proves the pre-trib rapture is a lie. Because the seventh one is the last one. I mean, you know, if, if, you know, if there's ten people in line and you show up and you go to the end of the line, you're the last one. There's not a another last trump before the first Trump, unless you're maybe Donald, I don't know. I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we sh shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye at the last Trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-17 For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Uh, that means we're not going to be first. They're, we're not going to precede them. Precede means to be before. We're not. No, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. We're not. Those of us who are alive and remain are not going to precede or be first ahead of the dead in Christ. 
they're going to rise first. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede, precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Yeah, a, a secret pre-trib rapture shout. With the voice of an angel uh, of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. I know I've beat this to death, but if we're not caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, it's the wrong Christ. It's the wrong Messiah. Personally, I think the Lord blinds the eyes of these pre-trib dispensational people because they worship the people, the Antichrists, that hate Jesus. They curse Jesus. They hate Jesus. Look up Sarah Silverman um, and uh, on YouTube. Sarah Silverman. And look up Jesus. Type in Sarah Silverman, Jesus, where, uh, and listen to her. I'd kill him again. Yeah. You want to bless, bless that? I don't. In these classic, now let's go back to the article. In these classic pre uh, I'm sorry, in these classic dispensational proof texts of the pre-trib rapture, we see that the righteous dead are raised first, and then those who are alive and remain are translated into incorruptible bodies and gathered to Christ. How then can the dispensationalists justify the concept of the Old Testament saints being raised at some later point in time? They can't. Some people are startled by the thought that the Old Testament saints will not be resurrected until the end of the tribulation, but keep in mind that the rapture is a promise to the church and the church only. And that exists only in the minds of dispensational pre-trib rapture Bible, well, church Bible teachers. Bible cemetery. How about that? Bible cemeteries. We see that the dispensationally imposed distinction between Israel and the church is at the root of this argument. The Old Testament saints are not, quote, in Christ, unquote, and therefore will not arise to everlasting life at the same time as the church saints. Again, this only exists in the minds of these Bible cemetery heretics. Okay, back to the article. According to dispensationalists, the Old Testament people were, are not the heirs of the Holy Spirit, are not regenerated by him, and are not grafted by him into Christ in the same way that the New Testament people are. Think about it, people. They, uh, they have multiple levels, uh, multiple ways of salvation here. The verse simply says that the dead in Christ will precede the living in Christ in the rapture. If you are saying that Daniel would be included in the dead, then you have to show that Daniel is in Christ. If you will study the New Testament, you will see that in Christ refers to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we are all given the one Spirit to drink. There is no way that Daniel was part of the body of Christ. This verse in 1 Thessalonians 4-16 through simply does not apply to him. This is what they teach people. The Holy Spirit did not permanently indwell believers in the Old Testament. It is not really people or time period that delineates the church. It is the Holy Spirit. Personal faith in Jesus Christ, which is what the passage is referring to, was not an option for Old Testament saints. They are not in view in this passage. It is referring to people who do not have the option of this personal faith in Jesus. Old Testament saints are in Christ in the sense that the present, um, in the sense that the death of Christ is the basis for the salvation of anyone past, present, future. However, they are they were not part of the body of Christ in the sense of having permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I don't know if I believe that, but... 
All right, so the uh, continue. The technical term for the church is those who are in Christ. First Thessalonians speaks of those who have died in Christ, being resurrected at the time of his coming in the air. The context has only the church in mind. Again, that exists only in the minds of pre-trib rapture dispensational theology people. The dispensational distinction between the Old Testament and New Testament saints, the church of Israel, is in fact what denies dispensationalism any claim to Christianity at all. For in that very distinction, dispensationalism teaches multiple methods of salvation by excluding the Old Testament saints from the ecclesia, the church. The dispensationalist, dispensationalist is required to produce some means other than partaking of the New Testament, uh, of the New Covenant, New Testament in Christ, for one or the other of the groups to be granted eternal life. The teaching of the church for the last 2,000 years precludes this, as does our Lord. Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. Oh, but but the last day, that must be the, the day before the pre-trib rapture, right? Or before the tribulation for the pre-trib rapture to work, huh? And I will raise him up the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And that's in John chapter 6 verse 53 through 56. Let's continue the article. Notice these points which contradict dispensational doctrine. No one has life who does not partake of the new covenant in Christ's blood. The Old Testament saints must partake, as does the New Testament and tribulation saint, in order to have life. All who partake are raised at the last day. That day is the end of days prophesied to Daniel, Daniel 12, 13. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of days. All who partake are in Christ and he in them. All the saints are promised the same resurrection by the same blood at the same time. And for this reason, he is, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. That's in Hebrews 9 verse 15. Now let's read Hebrews 11, 9 and 10. By faith, ah, I was right, Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which was foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Uh, Hebrews eleven thirteen through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now let's skip down to 39 of verse 40. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. The dispensationalist, ignoring the clear teachings of Scripture and the historic church, denies the existence of the General Assembly and falls back to perdition by advocating shadows as a, as a means of salvation for the Old Testament and tribulation saint, all in order to preserve, to preserve the delusion of the pre-trib rapture. What's a delusion? Believing something that's not true. I mean, you know, if you see a snake and you say, oh, that snake's not poisonous uh, or venomous, and 
it's a rattlesnake or a cobra and you pick it up and it bites you well that's a delusion you didn't believe it was dangerous but yet in fact it was and that's what they do they have to preserve their delusion of the pre-trib rapture continue the article but you have come to mount zion and to the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to god the judge of all to the spirits of just men made perfect to jesus the mediator of the new 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 covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of abel see that you do not refuse him who speaks for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now his promise saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace, grace, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And that's Hebrews 22 through uh, Hebrews 12, 22 through 29. Uh, the dispensational argument that proclaims that the Old Testament saint is somehow saved because of Christ rather than being in Christ by partaking of the new covenant in his blood is opposed to Orthodox Christian study of salvation. The truth will inevitably, inevitably, wow, Alzheimer's people, give me a break. The truth will inevitably manifest itself. It has in dispensational uh study of salvation the truth is that another way of salvation which is somehow connected with christ but not resting on christ is a different way the dispensationalist at this point is unconsciously perhaps consistent with himself he does not regard the old testament people of god as second third or fourth class citizens of the kingdom of god they simply are not citizens at all while dispensationalists roundly assert that old testament people were saved by christ there is no way in their salvational system they could be. And then this one asks, questions for dispensationalists. Um, if dispensationalists will simply answer these honest presented queries or questions, uh, we will be able to discern whether the accusations against dispensationalism are true. Has the Old Testament saint partaken of the blood of Christ shed for sins? Simple question, right? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Period. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 53 and verse 54. Let's read John, uh, Matthew 26, 26 through 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Another question. Does the Spirit of Christ dwell in the Old Testament saint? He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. John 6, 56. Let's read Romans 8, verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his Question three, are all the saints of all ages one body drinking of the same spirit? 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? 
the blood, bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, through many, are one bread and one body, for we partake of that one bread. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Wow. So, if one answers in the affirmative in the above queries, one has abandoned dispensationalism. Congratulations, brother or sister. Welcome to Orthodox Christianity. If one answers any of the above in the negative, then the accusations against, dispensational, it's against dispensationalism are true. And we would ask that that person to produce the means of salvation for the Old Testament saints. And people... They can't. They can't do it. So somebody asked me to prove that the church was Israel and Israel's the church. Um, Galatians 3, 26, 27, 28, and verse 29. That's a good one. And, um, you know, you can take this information copy down the scriptures and if you want to help family members or whatever that are brainwashed by these Zionist so-called churches well may the Lord guide your hand and open the eyes but uh, I've been trying for years without much luck and I say that sarcastically Honestly, I think God blinds their eyes. Honestly, I do. Because they bless those that curse Jesus. And God said he would bless those that bless him and curse those that curse him. Of course, he was speaking to Abraham, and Christ was of the seed of Abraham. So... But instead, they bless those that uh, Jesus said, "Year of your father, the devil." So, according to their eyes, I guess Jesus is cursed, in their eyes. So, all right. Well, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be on the tube. Um, I guess that's the end of the study. Um, like I said, this is not my work. This came from the internet, and I thought it was worth sharing. I would have used the King James, but it was still pretty decent, my opinion. Um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In His precious name, amen. <laughs>